going to read today's scripture verse. It is John 1, verses 14 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in, a place, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Please bow with me in prayer. Father God, we bow before you and we thank you, Lord, for your word. For the word revealed to us in the Bible, we thank you that it is true and that it reflects who you are, who we are, how we can have a relationship with you. We thank you for the living word, Jesus who was the, the best and final word of yours, he who became like us, who took on human flesh and willingly went to a cross to pay for our sins and rose victorious never to die again. We thank you for the salvation that you have provided through him for new life and for the good news. And Father, I pray that you would speak to each of our hearts and our minds this day as we look at your word and as we uh, seek to draw knowledge and strength, comfort and encouragement through you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Before we jump into uh, the passage of scripture, you know, I did tell you that the, uh, the Pastoral Relations Committee did buy me a book. It's a big book. And there's lots of jokes in it. So it seems that there was a pastor, uh, and he, uh, before the conclusion of the service, he said, now next week I'm going to be preaching on the sin of lying. And so in preparation for next week, I want to give all of you an assignment. I want everyone to read Mark chapter 17, and then we will, uh, we'll, you'll be ready for the sermon. So the next Sunday, he uh, got into the pulpit and he said, how many of you read the assigned uh, reading? And a number of hands went up, and he said, there's only 16 chapters in the book of Mark, and now I'm going to preach on lying. <clears throat> talk about uh, confessing that you need a sermon, right? Um, I thought after we uh, finish our room for doubt that it would be good for us to uh, do maybe a little summation, a, a little um, kind of focus on what the gospel is, what it is that we have to share with the world around us, the truth of what Jesus has done. And um, the Scripture that Brandon read for us this morning, it tells us that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we're going to focus on that, that balanced message, that balanced truth of what uh, the good news is. In uh, Randy Alcorn's book, The Grace and Truth Paradox, he writes, Birds need two wings to fly. With only one wing, they'll be grounded. The gospel flies on the wings of grace and truth. Not one, but both. And so we're just going to look at those uh, two, uh, two critical aspects of the gospel and uh, draw some conclusions. First of all, what is grace? Uh, what does it mean that, that God shows us grace? The, uh, the root word for grace in the New Testament, basically what it means is favor. 
It means God's favor toward us. Uh, the best definition I've ever heard of grace is, we can go to the next screen, the best uh, definition is unmerited favor. It means that God shows us this grace, this unmerited favor. It means you don't have to do anything to earn God's favor. In fact, you can't do uh, anything to earn the favor that he's, uh, he's demonstrated for us. I'd like to illustrate it with a story uh, about Eric uh, Little, uh, who became a prisoner of war. Um, and this story comes through uh, a lady named Margaret Holder. Margaret Holder was the daughter of missionaries in China. Uh, she was actually born in China. And uh, when the Japanese invaded China in 1939, uh, she, uh, with a lot of other uh, missionaries, were uh, uh, put in um, a war camp. And she was actually separated from her parents uh, for six years. And in this same camp, uh, Eric Little, so we probably most know him through the movie Chariots of Fire. Any of you seen that movie? Uh, he, he, was, he was the main character. He was the Scotsman who was a, a runner. And because of his uh, uh, Christian convictions that you're not supposed to work on Sunday, his favorite event was the 100-yard dash. And he, uh, uh, he uh, refused to actually compete for the one uh, medal that he was favored for because... Uh, the competition was going to take place on a Sunday. And so instead, he ran the 400 meter, which he was not favored in, and he set a world record, and he uh, won the gold medal. Uh, he was known as the Flying Scotsman because uh, he, he ran uh, very, he, he was very animated in his running and not the style that uh, runners normally are are encouraged to run in order to be fast. Well, when uh, Japan invaded China, he sent his then pregnant wife and two children back to Scotland, and he remained to continue ministering and caring for uh, the church and the people. And he was put in that uh, uh, camp as well. The kids didn't know him as the uh, gold medal winner, though. They knew him as Uncle Eric because uh, he was a teacher by profession, and uh, he would uh, give the kids lessons, and when the Japanese allowed them to have exercise free time, uh, he would uh, basically be the referee for uh, what they called football, what we call soccer, and he would uh, play with the kids. Eric never got to see his family again because uh, he died of a brain tumor in that camp uh, when he, uh, he had just shortly turned 43. Margaret tells how sad that was, but she, uh, she goes on and she tells this story of how uh, from time to time American planes would fly over. Uh, the military would fly over and they would drop barrels of food and supplies. And the Japanese would let uh, the, those that were imprisoned have those supplies because it saved them money, and uh, they would do that. And she said uh, they always looked forward to those barrels that would come. And one day, uh, they were standing in line for roll call in the morning, and uh, they saw the plane coming by, and it was coming around, and it was lower than normal, and they were dropping the barrels out, and as the kids were standing there uh, for roll call, they realized that the barrels had legs, that they were actually American soldiers that were coming uh, to rescue them. And as they started to land, uh, the children just ran past uh, the Japanese guards who gave them no resistance because they knew it was over. And they ran to these uh, soldiers and embraced them and uh, were overjoyed. Men they didn't even know, but they were so happy and excited. And those soldiers were absolutely delighted and excited, too, to be rescuing uh, these uh, children. And, um, 
And that's a pretty good picture, I think, of grace. Because grace is double-sided. Can I tell you that as much as we can uh, be appreciative of the grace that God extends to us, our God's heart is full of joy to give that grace to us. Uh, his, his love for us is what motivated uh, that grace uh, that sent his son Jesus uh, for us to rescue us from our sin. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it tells us, At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It was 1987. An 18-month-old baby Jessica fell down a well in Texas, 22 feet. Now, if you're way younger than that, this is history for you. But those of who, uh, us who lived through it remember it. 55 hours they worked round the clock to rescue this little baby girl. And I remember when they broadcast it on the news that they had retrieved her, thinking by that point that she was probably gone, but she was alive. It was like the whole nation rejoiced over this little baby girl. She could not do anything anything to rescue herself. She was, as the scripture here says, powerless, powerless to save herself. That's a pretty good picture of you and me. We are absolutely powerless to save ourselves, but God's grace sent his son Jesus to save us, to redeem us, to bring us back into fellowship with the living God. We just sang Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote that song. John Newton was a clergyman in the Anglican Church. Does anyone know what John Newton did before he came to Christ and became a minister of the gospel? That's right, he was a slave trader. He, uh, he was involved in slave trade in England, and he was on those ships that brought uh, slaves. And then he became uh, the captain of a ship. And in one of his books, he describes the horrific things that were done. And, uh, and with great regret, I believe, and shame, after becoming a Christian, God gave him this song. And to this day... Um, this is one of the favorite songs in the church uh, because it, it, it speaks of God's grace for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He was remembering how far he was from God and what God had done to retrieve him, to rescue him, to save him. Do you know there's a more modern version of this hymn now? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a soul like me. It ruins the song, quite honestly. Because if we, uh, if we lose the sense of wretchedness, we diminish the grace of God. Hear me. Um, I, I think this is real important uh, for us to get, especially uh, these days. You know, I, I, I think there's this thing where people want to kind of whitewash the sin and our brokenness and, and, and make it appear as if we're just not as bad as we really are in our hearts. And what we do by kind of cleaning it up is we just shrink the grace of God down to, it's almost like he just did us a little favor. And we fail to recognize that he went head over heels, leaps and bounds to get you and me and to bring us back. 
when we, we don't acknowledge our sin, we fail to see his grace. And his grace is greater than all our sin. And for that, we should be immensely grateful. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, the apostle Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you and I could inch our way back up to God, if we could somehow be good enough, then Jesus' coming was absolutely purposeless. But we can't make our way to God. God had to come down to us, and he beautifully did that because of God's grace, his favor toward us. So that's grace. That's one wing of the gospel. What's the other wing? Truth. What is truth? What is truth? In A.D. 33, Pilate asked Jesus that question. What is truth? Ironically, he asked Jesus that, and he didn't wait for an answer. He walked out, and he announced to the people who were plotting against Jesus, I don't see anything wrong in this man. He seems innocent to me. Pilate was standing before truth himself, truth incarnate, and he didn't know it. The Bible depicts our God, the living God, as omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent everywhere, omniscient, all-knowing. Our God is present at all times, knowing all things. He can't learn anything more than he already knows. And he's all-powerful. He can do all things. But you know something that our God cannot do? He cannot lie. He absolutely cannot lie. It's not that uh, it's impossible. It's the fact that it is against his very nature, and he is so consistent that he will never lie. And so what he says, you can bank on. Because he is completely true. Jesus, in uh, uh, John chapter 17, which is his priestly prayer, he, he's praying before God before he knows he's going to go to the cross, and he says this, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Truth is more than mere facts, uh, people. It's uh, not just something uh, that we learn about or know. Uh, truth uh, can't change, but you know what truth will do when you take it in? Truth will change you. It'll change me. When, when we become exposed to truth, when we take in the truth, and when we uh, respond to truth, it actually changes us. It it. It gets rid of falsehood and fear that goes along with it. There was a little fellow that was, uh, he was waking up, he was having nightmares, he was looking out the window, he was sure someone was going to get in the house night after night. And finally one night it was bothering him so bad what he was hearing and what he was seeing that he got up and he went into his mom and dad's room and he said, someone's trying to get in the house. And his dad went in his room, and he checked everything out, and he said, Son, tomorrow morning we're going to solve this. We'll solve it all. And so the next morning, he took him outside, and he showed him the tree, and he trimmed the tree because when the wind blew, it was scratching the window. And he showed him how at nighttime what he was seeing was from, from the light across the street, he was seeing the shadow of the tree. And that little fellow could go to sleep, and he didn't worry anymore that anyone was going to break in. Why? 
because he had the truth. He knew the truth. The truth can change us and change things for us. And the scripture tells us that we're to walk in the truth. In 3 John chapter 1, verse 3, uh, John is encouraging the believers, and he's saying uh, your faithfulness to the truth and how you walk in it is, is upright. You know, if we profess to be followers of Jesus Christ and we're not living, we know we're not living in accordance with what he instructs us to do in his word, then our walk is out of step. And, and the truth is divided in us. And we're given a bad picture to the world and we don't have confidence in God as we ought because he won't fail us when we follow him. We're also to be people who love the truth. That's what uh, Zechariah and also Paul and Thessalonians says, is to be lovers of the truth. In other words, we ought to be people who, we don't dust this off for Sunday morning, but that we're in it every day because it's true. And that we, uh, we, we, we should have an affection uh, for God's truth. And certainly we should believe the truth. Believing is resting in it, is knowing that what God says is reliable. I remember reading about uh, missionaries in Papua New Guinea, and in their language, they had nothing for the word trust or faith. They had, they, they had no concept of what that meant. And in this particular village with, where this missionary was, and he was working on a translation of the New Testament, he was trying to think of how he could convey what it meant to trust God. And they had, uh, they had a terrible problem with uh, venomous snakes in that area. And so everybody slept in a hammock up high in a hut. They built a hut, but everyone slept in hammocks uh, that were tied to the pole so that the snakes couldn't uh, sliver in and get them in the middle of the night. And they could rest in peace uh, in, in the hammock. And they had a word for laying in the hammock. And he finally concluded, well, that's the word for faith, for trust. Uh, because you can totally rest in that. You know that you're secure and, uh, and, and okay. And we're called to believe, to trust uh, in God's truth and to rest in that. And ultimately, all truth centers on Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the way, he's the truth and the life. And no one can come to God but through him. And that's our ultimate source of truth. That's the second wing. So you got these two wings. And there's this essential tension between both grace and truth. Kind of like a tightrope. Uh, if, if, if we're going to uh, share the gospel, if we're going to live out the good news of Jesus, we need both grace and truth. I know I've shared this before, but it's one of my favorite uh, illustrations of this kind of thing. Uh, C.S. Lewis and his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy uh, is, is talking, it's an it's a enchanted uh, 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 land, and she's talking to the beaver. And she's going to get to meet Aslan, the lion, who is the Christ figure in the story. And she's a little naturally nervous about meeting a lion. And she, uh, she asked the beaver, is he safe? And the beaver's response is, who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He's the king, I tell you. I think C.S. Lewis captured it well because our God isn't safe. Guess what? And I think, that's, I think that's what really makes people nervous because our God is true, he is good, but he's not safe. What do you mean, pastor, he's not safe? I mean he'll change your life. 
If you're holding on to control and you want your life to be your life and it be all about you, guess what? He's not safe. But he's good. And he wants what's best for you and me. And when we give him permission, then his truth and his grace radically changes our life for the better. Within Jesus himself, I think, we see both the picture of grace and truth. In Revelation chapter 5, we have of this, uh, we have John the Revelator gets to get a picture of worship in heaven. And uh, they're, they're worshiping, and at a certain point, they make this announcement, who is worthy to open the scroll? And there's silence, and there's no movement. And John begins to cry because John is so moved, he's thinking, well, is there nobody that can open the scroll and reveal God's plan? And the, one of the elders responds to John, and he says, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals because the throne and the four living creatures among the elders saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. What did the elder call uh, Jesus? What kind of animal? A lion. And what did John see? A lamb. A lamb that was slain. The elder says, look, behold, the king of the jungle. Look, behold, uh, the majestic one, the conquering one, the all-powerful one. And John looks and he sees a lamb that has been sacrificed, that is now alive. Jesus, the all-powerful truth. Jesus, full of grace and mercy, the slain lamb, all in one. You see, church, what happens is if truth without grace, if we have truth without grace, it, it, it breeds this legalism that can poison the church and uh, pushes the world away uh, from Christ. Uh, who were the people that Jesus had the most problems with? The Pharisees, right? And they were, they, they were, they were pushing, pushing, pushing God's law with no grace. In fact, Jesus says, you want to pile more and more on top of them to destine them to hell. And when, when we become all about uh, truth and getting in people's faces and, and shaming them and all that, guess what? That doesn't really share the gospel. But then you have the other extreme because grace without truth breeds moral indifference. And it keeps people from seeing that they even have a need for Christ. It's as if it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you do. And, and, and so that you don't give them the truth. And so they don't have a need, and others are repelled. You need both at the same time. Now, the Holy Spirit can apply, apply his word uh, to each of our hearts. But I'm going to close with two applications. One pertaining to evangelism, to sharing the gospel. And uh, I'll give you this quote that's in your outline from uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said evangelism must start with the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the demands of the law, and eternal consequences of evil. I was 14 years old. I had come to church by invitation from my friends. I did not grow up in the church. 
and it was only three weeks into my attending church when I heard very clearly from Romans the pastor preaching about sin and all fall short of the glory of God, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you're a sinner. And without Jesus, you will be eternally banned from heaven. And up to that point, I really thought God graded on a curve, and I was pretty decent. But I heard the truth. And then I heard the wonderful good news of grace. Because I heard the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But the gift, the gift of God is eternal life. Gift is grace, right? You don't earn a gift. You receive a gift. So I, I, I want to remind us as the church, because we live in this uh, time in which, um, honestly, I think people kind of shy away from the truth, but we have to share the truth. That every single person is a sinner, and without the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, without what God has done for us, we are bound to be separated from God for all eternity because we cannot be good enough on our own. So that's, that's a part of what we have to share. And that, that is the good news because there is bad news without the good news. And the other thing is how we exercise grace and truth with one another in the church. And I want to go back to Eric Little, Uncle Eric, as he was known in the camp. Monday through Saturday, everything went really well for the kids. They had lessons, they had free time, they played soccer, and they had a great time with one another. But on Sunday... Eric didn't participate because he didn't think he should. He had the conviction that he wasn't supposed to work on Sunday. And guess what happened in those soccer matches on Sunday? Fights broke out. <laughs> Skirmishes over a call about uh, whether it was in or whether it was out. And guess what, Eric, who gave up a gold medal in his favorite event, did? He started refereeing on Sunday, too. You know why? Because if it was about him and his honor and his glory, he would give it up for Jesus. But in this case, it was about others. It was about those children who needed a little direction, needed a little help, needed a little aid, and he'd put his conviction aside, and he'd show the grace of Jesus. Jesus said that they'll know you're my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. You know another word for love for one another? Grace. We need to uh, show grace to one another, show favor to one another, show care for one another. Application for evangelism, application for discipleship. And God may apply other things. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, we bow before you and we thank you that you are the perfect model of both grace and truth. I'm mindful of that uh, account in the gospel where the woman who was caught in adultery was dragged before you and thrown at your feet. And there were men that had heavy stones that were ready to stone her to death. For the truth, the law called for that, required that. And they ask you what to do. And the scripture tells us that you scribbled in the sand. And we don't know what you wrote, Lord, but we do know what you said. And you said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And thud, 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 
the stones started dropping. And those arrogant, legalistic men started walking away because they knew in their hearts that they weren't innocent in your eyes either, even though they were ready to take a life. And when they were gone, that woman looked up at you and you said, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. And you said, neither do I condemn you. You showed grace. But you also expressed truth because you told her, go and sin no more. Don't stay in that wrong life. Move ahead with God. Lord, help us to stay balanced. Help us to stay aflight in the gospel with both grace and truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is Tis so t sweet to trust in Jesus. And it truly is sweet to trust in someone who will never lie to you, who will never mislead you. And uh, as we uh, sing this song, I just simply want to say um, this invitation is an opportunity for you to respond to the living God. You can come, and if God is moving in your heart and calling you to place your faith in Jesus Christ, I or one of the counselors would be happy to pray with you. Maybe you feel that you need to rededicate your life. Perhaps God is saying you need to join this church family. Or maybe you need prayer for a concern. You come as God is leading. Let's stand and sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.